Hello and welcome. There have been some $30 billion of private equity and venture capital exits in the months from January to August 2021. Contrast this with $27 billion for all of 2018. So 2021 has clearly picked up in ways that we could have never imagined. Many, com uh, many private equity and venture capital uh, companies also got exits in uh, what we would call staggering initial public offers. Almost $800 million were raised uh, or, or got through offers for sale or OFS. Uh, which is essentially investors uh, offering their stake to uh, retail investors. So the cycle seems to be complete in many ways. Uh, invest uh, entrepreneurs, uh, start businesses, raise capital, uh, investors uh, in those businesses find exits. And of course, uh, a much, much uh, economic value has been created in this process. So the big question is going forward. What are these new digital scripts <coughs> that are at play here? What could, uh, what could be the big new story of 2021? If so, remember that the fact that this is happening in contrast to 2020 is itself a, a big story. So and within that, what's new? What are the new sectors uh, that, are, uh, that are likely to see more investment? Remember that the kind of investments we've seen in telecom, e-commerce, uh, uh, and uh, uh, even in areas like uh, SaaS businesses has been tremendous. Could there be new uh, areas or could we be seeing expansion of uh, existing areas? And of course, what could be the new business trends that we could see and all of which uh, could be of uh, use to both entrepreneurs, to investors, and particularly those who are looking at India in the longer context. To discuss this, I'm pleased to be joined by Haresh Chavla, a partner at True North, formerly India Value Fund, which manages over $3 billion of private equity funds. At True North, Haresh focuses on investments in the food and consumer sectors, where he identifies and helps transform mid-sized businesses. He's best known for his leadership in transforming the Network 18 Group into a formidable media network. Under his watch as founding CEO, Network 18 became India's fastest growing media and entertainment network. Harish uh, also has been engaged in the consumer internet revolution in India from the early 90s and credited with building India's largest, most well-known internet businesses like Money Control, Book My Show, Yatra, First Post and Home Shop 18, all of names you're if you are familiar with if you are particularly in India and or should be familiar with if you are not. Uh, Harish holds a bachelor degree in engineering from IIT Bombay and a master's degree in business management from IIM Calcutta. Harish, uh, thank you very much for joining us. So the uh, uh, tell us about the new digital scripts that you have been writing about very, very diligently for some years now and in a notable article in the beginning of 2021 and where we are today uh, in the middle of 2021 looking ahead. Thanks, uh, Govind. Thanks for having me. Great to see you again. Yeah, I think uh, when we look back, uh, 2021 will turn out to be a turning point for India as a whole nation, not just the digital part of the economy. It's, it's almost, you take 1991, uh, which was when we liberalized, we created a whole bunch of new companies, a wave of entrepreneurship took place, uh, liberalization uh, of the financial ecosystem happened, uh, money raising became easier for a whole new wave of entrepreneurs, new categories got created, new sectors got created. Uh, we are almost at that moment and then take another moment which is the Y2K moment where the Indian uh, software industry and the Indian software engineer, the, in the Indian software coder became globally renowned and they became part of virtually every uh, wave of digitization that, that has happened since then. I think when you take these two moments, you multiply them and you raise them to the power of N is what we're seeing in 2021. It's a, it's a phenomenal shift uh, uh, and the way to look at the shift, uh, you know, that's why I talk about multiple digital scripts because it's not easy. You know, it's happening at multiple levels actually. At a simple level, uh, what I've talked about earlier is that, you know, with the entry of Jiva in 2016, we became a nation of massive internet consumers. In a sense, people who, con let me qualify that, people who consumed content over the internet. But with COVID and with what's happened over the last one and a half years, we've all those internet consumers have become internet transactors. So, you know, I, I look at India at, you know, at three levels, there is a trillion dollar economy at the top uh, 10, 15 percent of our uh, uh, base. There is a whole fat middle, which is about a trillion dollars more and the bottom, which is again large, but that's only about half a trillion dollars. So till COVID happened, really the whole play was in the top one trillion dollar economy. Uh, and therefore, everybody was fighting for uh, India. And the second uh, uh, layer, which we call Bharat, had not really started transacting over the internet. But that's completely changed now. And therefore, we've, if you look at it, what's really happened is over 20 and 21, we have actually added a whole new set of transacting consumers. 
and a whole economy really, uh, which is almost multiplying India by two, uh, has come in now. And, and that's visible across categories. If you look at what's happening in tier two, tier three towns on consumption, on their buying on the net, what they are buying on e-commerce, how their, their food habits are changing, how they've grown the markets for online delivery. Uh, it's just a massive shift. So it, it's a difficult thing to just stand and understand it unless you look at it as if there are multiple scripts playing out like one of the large OTT shows like a house of cards or uh, you know suits or games of thrones. There are each of these aspects has to be seen differently to make sense of the uh, changes that are happening in India. So there is at one level a whole new set of consumers have come in. Remember you know our, our railroads have been ready for them. The UPI. So look at the confluence of things. There is massive smartphone penetration, the cheapest bandwidth in the world, uh, digital rails uh, for payments and now account aggregators coming and we can talk about it later. But essentially you're finding this whole confluence now playing out. A customers now willing to transact over the net. They're trusting uh, uh, the transactions over the internet. Uh, and frankly, offline cannot reach them anymore and everything can reach them online. In India too, what you're seeing is not that they are shifting from offline to online as much as what there was not available off offline at all is now they are buying online. So there is this democratization also that's happening. So it's a veritable kind of gold rush that's happening where the gold isn't likely to run out. The gold diggers, or maybe I need to call them miners, but really if you look at what's happening in the talent space in India, again, it's almost like gold digging. The spades are being sold and the railroad is available to go dig into these uh, gold mines. So really, I, th I think we are at a moment that is, has, have, we've never seen before and I don't think we'll ever see again. In the, what we'll see in the next five years is probably going to reset uh, India completely. Uh, much like you know, China went through these moments about 25, 30 years ago, we are likely at the same moment without realizing it today. And the, the middle trillion dollars that you talk about and, and the way it has opened up is something that you see as secular and going forward. And also, I mean, for those who perhaps are, uh, uh, are not completely conversant with this, uh, tell us the difference between the India and Bharat. I mean, why do we, uh, why have we uh, treated them distinctly? And to that extent, have they merged completely now? Yeah, so, uh, you know, India was always the wealthier part of our society. It was the more uh, educated, English speaking and more integrated with the world and had the capacity to spend, the money to spend. And uh, really, they, they, and they were the first people that were attacked by the Google, the Facebooks, the Instagrams and the uh, WhatsApp, right? But India too is what was kept out of that uh, or stayed out actually because their only real interaction was that the smartphone was an entertainment device. You know, they got bandwidth at fantastically low prices. Uh, it replaced their television because remember some places didn't even have electricity. So the smartphone would be on, but the TV would be off because there is no power. And, and therefore that became a path to watch video, uh, to um, talk to uh, your, your family members over, uh, let's say, free video calls and uh, play a few games. Uh, so essentially what was it? It became just an entertainment device. So we had a massive penetration of entertainment devices which are now becoming transaction devices. And now those people are realizing uh, they have services built for them in their own language. Uh, the language barrier has been broken uh, because now they can speak into the phone and transact. Uh, several of the apps are now also becoming easier to navigate. I mean, they're focused on uh, creating, uh, uh, you know, the interfaces for Bharat. Uh, and the third thing that happened that they now see a whole world of options that were never available to them. You see, the, the offline retail in India has actually never matured up. It's still, you know, 10, 12, 14% of the total retail market. Large part of retail in India was concentrated on the metros and a few top towns and never reached uh, the people uh, in these markets. Services never reached them. Now look at their situation. They can now pay their phone bill online, electricity bill online. They can buy clothes from Mintra or Amazon or Flipkart or any of the um, uh, vehicles they can... They can shop over WhatsApp through any, lots of the social media commerce. Their kids are now all over on social media on the platforms that are, you know, uh, kind of copies of TikTok here. So you're seeing a whole change in mindset, change in aspiration, change in consumption. That is, uh, you know, it's like a, a, a what could have happened over five years has happened in one year. I mean, I mean that's the kind of uh, speed at which things have been changing.
there is a Bain report uh, on on uh, online retail in India, and they are talking about how uh, one women participation in shopping has gone up. Two, how uh, tier two, tier three towns have doubled or trebled in several cases uh, the amount of online shopping they do. So really, that's a full wave. Remember that once they've all stayed away from transacting over the internet. They were all, you know, we will order cash on demand, uh, cash on delivery. We will not uh, use our debit card, credit card. We will not use OTPs. All of that fundamentally has changed and they now trust the internet like they never did. So if you were to look at now the opportunities uh, existing and future, so uh, e-commerce companies have already come in and they're essentially selling the same product with much, uh, with much greater ease and uh, smoothness perhaps. Uh, payment obviously has become far more uh, frictionless uh, in this period and finally delivery uh, and logistics obviously have uh, really beefed up and become smarter and there's technology injection in all these businesses. So as you look ahead, uh, even starting today or at this point, what, where do you see uh, the supply and demand for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial uh, ventures and what is the best way that this demand can be met or can be expanded as you look ahead? So I see, uh, you know, my sense is this is both the product market and the services market are set to explode. You know, my sense is that there is a whole India is under penetrated as far as brands go, as far as brands at multiple price points go, as far as brands uh, which play different roles in making people's life convenient go. So you find I, I think that there is a whole D2C, D2C wave and we are seeing uh, how uh, almost a billion dollars is flowing into that uh, kind of market right now and just in the last few months. Uh, where funds of funds are being created in a sense uh, to, to you know, fund and grow D2C ventures. Now, that space, I think, is just at the, at the beginning. I think uh, we would have probably, you know, between anywhere between 2,000 to 5,000 D2C brands being created uh, over the next few years, uh, which will, you know, address every segment of the market differently. So that opportunity, remember, you know, uh, we are all... Uh, uh, in a sense, including me, are old school in a sense that we believe that a company's uh, um, uh, focus or company's growth is restricted by its market. What technology has done, and we've seen that over and over again in multiple segments, is the moment you make it frictionless to consume, the moment you make it convenient to consume, uh, the moment you create easy access, uh, the industry size transforms itself. It happened in music. I mean, it happened in uh, in photos. I mean, when you make it music digital, everybody has access to everything. You suddenly transform the consumption pattern of people. Online delivery, for example. The fact that I can order a hot meal uh, to my home or a hot snack at home uh, in and it reaches piping hot in about 15 minutes to my place uh, completely transforms my consumption behavior. So what we are unable to imagine is this whole idea that because technology is now uh, going into the DNA of several of the offerings, the, they will transform the industry attractiveness completely. And that's the other thing that we'll start seeing. So when we see D2C brands and uh, several other categories of consumption that are going to kick in, uh, I think uh, we, are, we have to leave out what's happened in India so far. And maybe take examples of China or America or several other more developed markets because that's the kind of growth in TAM we are likely to see. So that TAM is going to be visible across segments, whether it's education, financial services, home services, furniture. I mean, furniture and, uh, you know, home, uh, uh, let's say, uh, renovation and home uh, stuff is just exploding now. As people realize they have to stay at home, as new homes are being uh, bought in India, as interest rates have dropped. So my sense is that we are seeing uh, uh, every each segment has to be examined uh, independently and almost we are rewriting the rules of the game uh, uh, in each segment and that's going to hurt the incumbents uh, dramatically over the next few years actually. Right and, and that's an important point I guess to note that you know do not look at the past if you're at all trying to build the future because the past can in many ways imprison you. So you know talking about incumbents now we've seen some big acquisitions here the Tata group uh, which is uh, in, in pretty much India's oldest conglomerate in that form has uh, bought into uh, a pharmaceutical distribution company it has bought into a grocery company uh, 1MG uh, and Big Basket. So what is this telling you and and what lies ahead is this is this move going to, uh, you know, pan out? I mean, is it going to be a happy ending even in the near term or could and, and could there be concerns? And uh, what does it tell you of the market and its behavior? 
so so what we are seeing are two trends actually uh, one is that um, conglomerates like tata and reliance and maybe even now you'll find airtel and bharti uh, several of the large adani probably you know all these conglomerates will actually buy digital businesses because they can see how transformative uh, uh, they are and what the big threat to them is they can be just completely left out of the game right so that's one trend uh, and whether you call it super app or semi super app whatever you know nomenclature you give it it's essentially these companies realizing that the dna doesn't sit within them they need to acquire businesses and maybe imbibe some of that dna back into their old uh, uh, legacy businesses so i i think that's one transformation that uh, we'll all actually witness as we go along and the other transformation we are seeing is that because of this sudden you know india 2 being added to india when the market size becoming so massive we are seeing massive wall of vc capital come in and therefore companies that were that have built let's say farm easy have built online franchises now realize that they can go and acquire old great offline franchises digitize them and that gives them a fantastic hook and a much more rounded experience a omni channel experience for consumers so i think you'll see both of these uh, let's say forces now um, you know really at some point fight each other uh, and that's that's what we're going to see over the next few years there will be both sides will have challenges actually uh, if the cold conglomerates do not let these digital companies operate with their own dna and almost give them a free hand uh, uh, because the culture Uh, the kind of talent you need to retain and recruit there, which is going to be a big crisis for them now, uh, is going to be very different. I mean, th- there are uh, you cannot hire good engineers anymore. First of all, they are not good engineers available in the market anymore. Uh, but they you cannot hire them into a old legacy company anymore. They they want to work for uh, salary. They want options. Uh, they want to be in a environment where they flourish, where they are working with like-minded people and testing the boundaries of technology. none of that is available in in old fashion company and that's why you see the struggles of the banks or a struggles of an hdfc bank for example or you seeing the other bank struggle they are nowhere near uh, uh and, and and that's a stark reality less than i think less than 2% of the online payment on the payments which you do on retail like you ha- are done by the traditional banks uh upi uh, share of the traditional banks is is abysmal so you are using google pay using phone pay using paytm You're using the multiple other uh, wallets, uh, and you're not using the banks at all. So they cannot even hire these people. So that's one big challenge for them. Equally, uh, I think there has been a, a bunch of capital with the online companies integrating an offline business. They will they will discover the challenges, the cultural differences. So we'll see all of this play out over the next uh, few years, actually. So and and fintech, and now that you've touched upon it, is an important component of all of this. Where in itself, we've seen uh, many new ventures, many. Uh, Uh, in many cases ownership changing hands and of course exits yeah. happening so tell us about fintech and you yeah. you you touched upon account aggregators so what's happening in the broad space uh, broad space of fintech in india uh, both from a technology point of view and an opportunity point of view yeah so when you look at fintech uh, you know you are always keep in the back of your mind that there is a banking license that's tightly regulated so once that you know everything you look at in the, in the framework of fintech in india is that there is a regulator watching and is probably going to be more protective of the banks uh, 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 than of the new age fintech company so that's one little backdrop you have to look at it against but clearly we are seeing uh, uh, you know the indian banks put a huge cost transaction cost uh, on 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 the customers because eventually uh, regular savers have to end up paying for priority sector lending they have to end up paying for bad loans they have to end up paying for the huge branch infrastructure and uh, and let's say the manpower that the whole banking system currently deploys so that all results in the banks having a spread which is much higher than it needs to be because finally if a person has the same credit rating the uh, has a good credit rating the cost of his funds should not be much higher than what somebody is giving uh, you know willing to lend on the other side for and i think in that margin lies the whole game uh, of the indian uh, fintech space at one level and at second level we are finding that the uh, digital rails that are getting ready the whole account aggregator platform you know that will transform the credit uh, availability to small businesses it will it will you know it will you know you you almost can't imagine the impact it will have on their uh, ability to access working capital and therefore the transformation in their own businesses so i think once the account aggregator system kicks in once data 
uh, can be trusted and you don't have to en end up spending so much resource on diligencing uh, uh, the, the customer, uh, uh, so much effort on trying to figure out that you're not uh, defrauded. Uh, that will bring down the transaction costs even more. And it will eventually happen that there are even good businesses that don't get uh, credit today. So the good business will start getting credit. Good consumers who have good credit rating will start getting lower interest rates. So we are seeing a, you know, we'll see a transformation in that market as well, where uh, lending itself will become more personalized. You will be able to access lower rates as you do in the West uh, based on your credit history. And millions of businesses now will be able to access money uh, at seven, eight, nine percent, which you know by Indian standards is fantastic for them to uh, grow. So I think that whole from a credit starved economy to a credit rich economy, that shift uh, which Nandan Nilikani talks about, uh, has been talking about for several years, is now ready to happen. And again, that's kind of a wave, which I say 1991, 2000, 2021, the next wave will be when we become credit rich as well. And uh, any numbers uh, that you can put to this and also, you know, your original uh, tier, the three tier economy, the top tier, the middle tier and the yeah. bottom tier. How, and and how, does, uh, how does all this, particularly the fact that we are able to view, view or visualize a customer more clearly in terms of his or her credit rating, how will this transform, where will that transformation happen and how dramatic could it be? So, uh, so here is what has happened actually because of uh, the past uh, 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 the waves of two things. One is demonetization hit us uh, and forced a little level of formalization and that weakened, let's say, our small uh, firms. The second thing was hit was COVID, which actually has, uh, uh, COVID and GST actually over the last two years, uh, have really hit small firms badly and, and really, uh, my sense is the pendulum swung the other way on formalization. And, it, and, and remember, jobs are not created by the formal economy at the same speed as small businesses. We need our small businesses to do well. My sense is with the account aggregator, which my, will be pushed uh, quite uh, well and deeply, I sense the government will do that. Uh, you will actually find a revival in our small business uh, economy and that's required because otherwise we will never be able to, you know, get the jobs that we need to give to our young people. So it's almost like a mandatory thing for account aggregator go and small help go and small help small businesses because that's the way we'll solve our job problem otherwise we are on a on a path to extreme formalization uh, uh, which is really going to hurt us in the long run so you know that's how i see the whole uh, game playing out uh, uh, over the next few years and, and what are the kind of uh, investment uh, opportunities that you see in this space? And I'm talking about within Fentech. Is it going to be more, let's say, on the rating, the uh, maybe AI-driven, uh, uh, you know, understanding of uh, consumers, more algorithmic? So, so and, and broadly, I mean, if you were to classify, let's say, the first wave of Fintech about removing friction and access, how would you characterize this second wave, if one can call it that? I would call the second wave the smart wave. Actually, now is the time where you know you will be able to identify that this person or this business has this single bank account. The single bank account has this cash flow coming into it. Uh, this is the contract. I'm sure. I'm sure when you mix it with smart contracts and authentication and credit rating, I think you really have a smarter, let's say, profile of a customer or a business trying to access credit. And, uh, and therefore that will cut down the fraud risk. The moment it cuts down the fraud risk, it cuts down the cost for everybody because you know everybody otherwise prices finance uh, taking into account the fraud risk and the uh, default risk. So my sense is that there is much more information going to be available. That information was available, but it was not available in one place. It was not available consistently and it was not available at a level where you could trust it. And that's what's going to change. So I think this whole smarter, uh, kind of uh, 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 let's say profile that's going to develop the digi locker that will come up the account aggregator and probably you know this whole crypto and NFT wave uh, we, um, clearly not coming into fintech but blockchain as it gets used and as companies start sharing information and profile data uh, you'll find a whole wave of uh, you can now go and really auction your credit off that's what's going to happen You'll be able to stand and say, here is, I want a loan for my car or my house. I want people to bid for it. I think that's what's going to happen now. 
Right, and I, I'm going to come to you for you know where you see the the bigger entrepreneurship opportunities. But before that, you know, you did mention regulation, and that's one reason in in fintech or in banking and finance where you know maybe expansion is not going to be as simple. For instance, right now we're looking at a situation where the Reserve Bank, uh, if that is India Central Bank, is saying that you know uh, everyone has. I mean, auto debit is not going to be an e uh, allowed as easily as it used to be earlier. That means uh, you know I mean obviously that's another level of friction created between my payments or my subscriptions uh, to let's say uh, the New York Times or Netflix and so on. So how do you see this uh, you know this let's say tension between regulation uh, which is of course not a new tension but between regulation and entrepreneurship particularly in the in, in the fintech space. So actually fintech has another color to the regulation is that in some sense the banks are being kept involved and that will be necessary from an RBI's point of view. If you look at what UPI, UPI makes sure that the bank is involved in the payment transaction though you never interface with the bank. You can go through your whole day uh, buying everything online, spending on the nearest pan shop through your payment app. And actually UPI is forcing you to actually go back to your bank, which would, would, would have not have been the case. So therefore there are, there is a, you know, there are regulations that are there to protect, let's say consumers. And there are some flavor of regulations also to make sure that banks are protected and play a role in this developing fintech market. Because remember at some level, every regulator needs to know what's happening to credit flow in the economy. We've seen that uh, in China where when they lost, when they were lost or they were about to lose control over what was happening in their financial system, they stepped down and stepped down very hard. India probably be seeing a bit of, uh, you know, two steps forward, one step back, which is not a bad thing because at least we are moving and moving, evolving slowly in the right direction. But remember that, you know, banking regulations are going to be a challenge everywhere in the world because you cannot have a central bank just completely clueless about what's happening to the velocity of money, what's happening to credit. Uh, and what's likely to be a, uh, you know, are they creating a default risk in the country? So I don't think there is a case for, uh, you know, technology in the financial services industry to just be given a free ride uh, anywhere in the world. I mean, wherever it's happening, it will get regulated uh, or get controlled a bit. Right. And, and, and entrepreneurs should watch out for that. So uh, you've touched upon China yeah. and uh, China is now top of the mind for slightly different reasons. I think the earlier it was more about, you know, the, the tensions between India and China. Uh, now it's also about what's happening within China and China going after major uh, tech companies. And that's something that began began with Alipay uh, and Alibaba Group, but now has accelerated into many other areas. What does that tell us? And uh, uh, what does that tell us as in tell us? And what is the, the contrasting opportunity, if any? So my sense is that, you know, I, I think if you look back historically over China, China has had a series of social experiments. And now we are seeing, you know, the next five year plan as one more uh, social experiment that's going on. They have, uh, I mean, the single child rule that they put in place 30, 35 years ago is now coming to bite uh, as they are now realizing they have an aging population and, and they are unable to get their current population to start having kids because, you know, it's difficult for uh, housing is expensive, school is expensive. So they are trying to undo a, a experiment that they did several years ago and are now really caught up in their own, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, tangle on it. Because, you know, to change uh, behavior of millions of consumers by sending them signals, incentives, is going to be difficult. And, and therefore, uh, they, they are trying to figure it out. At another level, I think there is this, the world is evolving into two internets where, uh, you know, uh, there is the whole American version and the Western version of the open internet and there's the Chinese version of the, clo of the closed internet, which they're developing. Uh, they banned cryptocurrencies a couple of days ago. So essentially, you know, you can see this war on technology taking place. There is China, uh, which has the resources, uh, which has the technology, which will probably create its own digital currency, is already a neck to neck on AI as well uh, in the world uh, on one side. And uh, uh, the Western Internet, which is open and which we fully understand. Uh, and India is probably sitting, it's going to play a massive role in the open internet. I think I think India's position suddenly transforms uh, and has transformed with COVID because we are the hotbed of talent. Uh, we can provide, uh, we have now become the hotbed of products. I think this interview is happening at a time, you know, extremely proud uh, that uh, every Indian needs to be that a uh, uh, fresh work, which is a 
Indian software product company just got listed and you know and, and that's like really going to set off a wave of uh, Indian product companies on the globe much like uh, and therefore India will now be counted over the next decade in the league of Silicon Valley, Israel, uh, the Scandinavian countries as a technology product uh, creator in the world and I think that's transformative. So I think India's role is, as a supplier of talent and now as a supplier of product actually gets cemented. Uh, and remember that we are now as it's, it's the largest accessible connected internet market in the world because China is not accessible to anybody. And therefore, uh, the kind of money that will come in uh, because the investments will come in, uh, the kind of opportunities that created for us, for the talent we have in India, the kind of opportunities we are now seeing for even our software services companies. Look at what's happened uh, to the TCS, Infosys and even the whole slew of mid-sized software companies. I know their market caps have gone up, but market caps have gone up on the back of incredible amount of demand uh, that they're seeing now, as every company in the world is trying to go digital, right? So therefore, you're seeing these changes and, and this whole situation with China actually brings the focus back to India and India will play a massive role in the open internet. And I think that's fantastic uh, for it to happen. And companies are seeing the example. Because we are seeing, we have created the public digital backbone. Our transaction costs on financial services is far lower than America has today. So at several levels, because we are mobile first, because we are, you know, because we cater to India too, we have created, let's say, the frugal internet as well to some degree. We have brought down the transaction costs. We found fixes to authentication. We found fixes to payments. We found fixes to delivery. We found it fixes to food delivery. So, you know, I think the fixes we'll find here can be exported all over the world. So we can export UPI, we can export account aggregator, we can export um, Aadhaar, we can export uh, many of the other services that are being built for India too. Uh, as you're seeing companies like Dukan and Khata Book and all these kind of businesses which are really creating a, a much, uh, let's say, inexpensive version of the same um, uh, software that you see in the West. So that whole cloud revolution will also take place out from India. And maybe another one to that list could be the Coven uh, app, which is our uh, vaccine aggregator uh, platform of those. Yeah. So, so between the two, and I'm going to come to you for the big bets in a moment, Arish, but between, let's say, companies, uh, you mentioned Freshworks, which are really uh, global to start with, versus companies yeah. or uh, ventures that are domestic market focused, how are you looking at the two and uh, are there any preferences? Um. Um, really, my sense is both are incredible opportunities. So there are companies that are uh, digitizing, let's say, Indian businesses uh, or, or offering services to Indian consumers are probably uh, bringing back, let's say, even uh, uh, or, or buying out legacy businesses and digitizing them. I think there's a massive opportunity in India. Equally, I think uh, globally, the uh, services like Zenoti, Freshworks, Zoho, uh, and you can name a bunch of companies that are trying to create global products out of India. Both, uh, you know, it will come down to the DNA of the founder, uh, the capability of the team, the kind of product they make. So, you know, each, you'll have to then go to the specific use case. But the TAM has been reset uh, uh, and uh, for both. In a sense, now if you're an Indian company building software for the world, like you see Browser Stack or you see Postman, all these companies are, are doing uh, phenomenal jobs globally. Uh, so... I, I don't see there is, you know, each opportunity will have to wait on that specific company. But uh, market opportunity for them is, is incredible. I mean, look at what's happening in logistics or even trucking uh, in India. These are all fantastic growth opportunities. Actually. Right. Uh, big bet question still coming up. Uh, what, what are the risks or downsides that one must uh, uh, bear in mind or, or, you know, factors to watch out for uh, in, 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 this, uh, in, in, in all the, the good news that we've been seeing so far? Yeah, so I think one of the key challenges we have is that, you know, I, and I call it this, I think India is now getting a digital dividend because of COVID and what's happened in the globe much before it can extract its demographic dividend. So, so I, I think one of our continuous challenges uh, is, is going to be how to, you know, create some sense of equality and, uh, you know, not create a two-tier, you know, a deeper two-tier economy where there is the people who have and the have-nots are a much larger uh, base. Uh, you know, I know, you know, it, it, it's tough, uh, job situation is bad today uh, uh, and, and therefore we need to really focus on making sure it doesn't become a Brazil kind of uh, situation where uh, there are a few people with lots of money and there is a vast uh, population that is really, you know, really living hand to mouth or is struggling constantly uh, to 
get out of their situation and, and make life uh, better for the next generation. So I think I think we have to really figure out how to use the digital dividend and transfer it to uh, really reach out and get uh, our demographic dividend, which remember China doesn't have. We still have that fantastic opportunity. We have uh, the Indian family unit is something that can win uh, this war for us uh, against China because uh, it's integrated. Uh, uh, our family unit is intact. Uh, uh, our, the parents are focused on education, making sure that next generation does better than them. That whole, let's say, DNA and behavior uh, can take us out of it. If we make the right steps in making sure uh, education, healthcare, electricity, infrastructure all falls in place, we, we need that to happen. Right. So your concerns are really more uh, at a macro level and a public policy level from what I can see. So uh, and, and not so much, let's say, on either regulation or market size or trade policy and so on. Not really. My senses are regulators are uh, we've seen that uh, since 91, actually. So our regulation is never a straight path in India. But uh, I think we are all evolving in the right direction. From you look at what's happening in insurance, what's happening in um, let's say even what they've done for Ola and Uber uh, in India, there will be restrictions. I don't think, uh, uh, you know, India will allow technology companies to come and wipe out markets. Uh, and therefore, we evolve slowly. So I had no concern on that front. I think our big concerns are really macro. How do we make sure that the millions of people who had a setback through COVID, millions of people who are unlikely to get job because our manufacturing sector hasn't taken off. How do we create millions of coders? Because, you know, that's a massive opportunity. I call it, you know, code for India is more important than make made in India or make for made uh, made for India. We, we can supply millions of coders to Indian software companies to global software companies. And really, it will pull us out of this uh, situation we are in. Right. Okay. So uh, uh, last question or close to last question. So what, what are the big bets and uh, what are the big opportunities that you're seeing uh, and uh, by either by sector or by uh, vertical? And where do you think equally uh, would be the opportunities for people to either invest or create businesses? So, uh, you know, I, I, clearly we talked about financial services and how this whole, you know, see what happened when we created UPI, we created a whole set of companies on that base. I think the next thing that's happening is account aggregator that will give rise to a whole bunch of, you know, unicorns who base their businesses off it. Uh, the a smart contract. So I think getting India to do business in a much easier, much more secure uh, and much more credit worthy uh, manner is one huge opportunity that I can see happening. That's one. We talked about D2C. Uh, again, either it's D2C or it's traditional brands really uh, embracing the whole digital transformation. That's going to happen. Uh, that's the other opportunity I see happening. And the third is social media and social commerce, uh, which, uh, uh, which again is, is a massive, un, let's say it's not taken off as much as China, but it will. So therefore, that's the other uh, wave that I see happening as people try and monetize their social commerce uh, and social links with uh, customers in India. So three kind of spaces I see really doing well. Right. And, and uh, personally, you also invest in a lot of companies. Uh, what's been your own, whether you've invested or not, what's been your own biggest surprise uh, on the upside? Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about the downside, but uh, surely what's been an upside that where, I mean, you've thought of everything, you've, uh, uh, you've uh, seen the ducks line up and yet it's been a, a positive surprise for you. So, uh, you know, really gaming, actually. I mean, it's, 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 I never thought that India will uh, move to gaming at, because gaming failed in many av avatars before uh, COVID uh, or before the last two, two and a half years. And that really is just taken off. I mean, you're finding people uh, uh, gaming and they're willing to put money and play with games. So that's one. Uh, the second thing I'm really surprised by is the desire of Bharat to pay for uh, content. Actually, it's surprising that uh, we we always had this uh, thing that we'll have to give away everything free. But uh, businesses that are selling content or creating content and are creating uh, a small bite-sized uh, content and taking charging for it are getting customers. So it's unbelievable that the small size payments has taken off so well. I think these are two kind of things that I, it surprised to me. 
Right, and and both are very important in telling us about the very nature uh, of this consumer, the the nature of this consumer in this very interesting uh, three tier economy that's uh, evolving very very rapidly in India, and the sheer opportunity that lies ahead, uh, particularly as we create more products, more uh, uh, more direct to consumer products, and of course the payment system that will make all of the, all these flows very easy uh, and and simple, and therein lies some of some of the biggest opportunities. Uh, Harish Chavla, partner at uh, true not thank you so much for uh, speaking to me hope to see you soon again thank you thanks over bye bye